Welcome, and thank you for joining today's National Industrial Security Program Policy Advisory Committee meeting, also known as the NISPAC. To receive all pertinent information about upcoming NISPAC meetings, please subscribe to the Information Security Oversight Office's overview blog at isu-overview.blogs.archives.gov or go to the Federal Register. All available meeting materials, including today's agenda, slides, and biographies for NISPAC members and speakers have been posted to the ISU website at www.archives.gov slash ISU slash oversight hyphen groups slash NISPAC slash committee dot HTML and have also been emailed to all registrants. Not all NISPAC members and speakers have biographies or slides. While you are able to connect by phone only, you're welcome to join WebEx with the link provided with your registration, as all available materials will be shared during the meeting on that platform. If you've connected through WebEx, please ensure you've opened the participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a private chat message to the event producer. Please note all audio connections are currently muted, with the exception of NISPAC members, speakers, and ISU, who we ask to please mute their own lines when not speaking. If you are not a member of the NISPAC and would like to ask a question or make a comment, please hit pound 2 to raise your hand if you've connected to the audio conference. If your audio is coming through WebEx today, you may click the hand icon at the bottom of your screen or send your question to all panelists through chat. Another option is to email your questions and comments to nispac at nara.gov and someone will answer your questions there. This is a public meeting. Like previous NISPAC meetings, this will be recorded. This recording, along with the transcript and minutes, will be available within 90 days on the NISPAC Report on Committee Activities webpage mentioned earlier. At the conclusion, a survey will be provided for feedback. If you'd like to be contacted regarding your survey responses, please include your email in the comments block so the NISPAC team can get back to you personally. Let me now turn things over to Mr. Bill Fisher, the Acting Director of ISU, as well as the Acting Chairman of the NISPAC. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the National Industrial Security Program Policy Advisory Committee. I'm Bill Fisher, the Acting Director of ISU. I'm the Director of the National Declassification Center at the National Archives in my permanent position. I will now turn it over to my designated Federal Officer, Heather Harris Pagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will now begin attendance for the government members. I will state the name of the agency, then the agency member will reply by identifying themselves. Once I have gone through the government members, I will then move over to the industry members. After the industry members, I will then proceed to the speakers. OB&I. Good morning. Thank you, everyone. I'm happy to be here today. This is Lisa Perez. Thank you, Lisa. DOD. Good morning, Heather. This is Jeff Spinninger. Good morning. DOE. Good morning, Heather. This is Natasha Sumter. Good morning, NRC. Good morning. This is Dennis Brady. Good morning, DHS. Good morning. This is Rob McCray. Thank you. DCSA. Good morning, Matt Roche. Good morning, CIA. Good morning, Heather and fellow members. Uh, this is Don from CIA. Thank you. Commerce, DOJ. Good morning, Heather. This is Tanya Field. Good morning, NASA, NSA. Good morning, everyone. This is Matt Armstrong. Good morning, State Department. Good morning, this is Kim Cologne. Good morning, Air Force. Annie Backus, Department of the Air Force. Good morning, Navy. Hello, Andy Jones here. Good morning, Army. 
Now I'm going to turn over to the industry members. Ike Rivers. Good morning. This is Ike. Good morning. Derek Jones. Derek Jones present. Good morning. Tracy Durkin. Good morning. Tracy's present. Good morning. Greg Sadler. Good morning. Greg's here. Good morning. Dave Tender. Good morning. Dave's here. Good morning. Jane Dinkle. Dr. Doug Edwards. Good morning. Doug Edwards is here. Good morning. Kathy Andrews. Good morning. Kathy Andrews here. Good morning. Now I will do a roll call for the speakers. Mike Fowler. Good morning, Mike Fowler's here. Good morning, Blaine Bucci. Blaine Bucci's here. Good morning, Chris Pollock. Good morning, Chris Pollock's here. Good morning, Dave Scott. Good morning. Good morning, Mike Ray. Good morning, Mike Ray's here. Thank you, Tracy Kendall. Good morning. Good morning. Perry Russell Hunter. If anyone else is speaking during the NISPAC that we have not heard from or we don't know about, please speak now. All right, thank you. We request that everyone identify themselves by name and agency, if applicable, before speaking each, each time for the record. Because this is a longer meeting than they have had been the last couple of years, we are planning on a five minute break in the middle of the meeting. I wanna remind the government membership of the requirement to file a financial disclosure report with the National Archives and Records Administration Office of General Counsel. Before a government member may serve on the NISPAC and annually thereafter, this must be done. The same form for financial disclosure that is used throughout the federal government, OGE Form 450, satisfies the reporting requirement. If there are any questions, please reach out to me. Moving on, we've had a few changes to the NISPAC membership. The Department of Energy's former primary member, Mark Karnowski, is no longer a member. Natasha Sumter has replaced Ms. Primary, and Ms. Jamie Gordon replaced Natasha as alternate. Mr. Tracy Kendall remains an alternate as well. Keith Miner, formerly the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency primary representative is retiring this summer. Matthew Roach has replaced him as primary, and Derek Broussard is now the alternate for DCSA. Keith, thank you for all you have done for the security mission. You will be missed more than you know. While not a member of the NISPAC itself, the alternate designated federal officer, Robert Trimbali, is retiring after over 20 years with ISU and over 30 years with the National Archives. Robert, I appreciate all you have done for ICU and me. Thank you. Enjoy retirement, gentlemen. This is also the last public meeting for two of our industry members, Derek Jones and Tracy Durkin. Thank you so much for your contributions to the security mission. The new industry members will be announced at the next public meeting. For those departed members, thank you for your contributions over the years. We look forward to continuing the work you have done with the new representatives. In addition, ICU's 2023 annual report to the president was published earlier this month. ICU's report provides statistics and analysis of the classified national security information and controlled and classified information programs based on ICU's review of departments and agencies, self-assessment reporting, and ICU's targeted oversight reviews. On ISU's role in safeguarding and declassifying potentially classified information outside of government control, per 32 CFR Part 2001, ISU routinely, routinely assists non-governmental organizations and private citizens who find potentially classified information in their possession. In fiscal year 2023, ISU received inquiries from six different organizations. In all instances, these institutions sent records from their holdings to ISU for temporary safeguarding until they are determined to be unclassified or are properly declassified through the mandatory declassification review process. Records determined to still contain classified information following an agency level review remain in the custody of ISU until they can be declassified in their entirety. 
ICU issued Notice 2023-Tax01, which provided guidance to individuals and organizations on how to identify potentially classified information and how to protect and transmit classified records to ICU for review upon discovery. Regarding Executive Order 13556, the Controlled Unclassified Information Program Implementation and Oversight. While there have been some progress in implementing, there has also been a growing interest in identifying methods and strategies to help simplify CUI where possible without sacrificing the integrity of the program. This has been a key area of focus within the ongoing CUI reform efforts of the White House's National Security Council. The delay in issuing the CUI Federal Acquisition Regulation, also known as the FAR Clause, contributes to the proliferation of non-standardized approaches by agencies that disadvantage contractors and create gaps in security and reporting. In June of 2022, the NSC issued a memorandum to departments and agencies which aim to overhaul, update, and streamline how the executive branch creates and manages both classified and controlled unclassified information. Our office is participating in the interagency process that memo initiated. We recommend that any specific questions related to the status of the process, including anticipated timeframes or policy outcomes, be directed to the NSC. In accordance with the Public Interest Declassification Act of 2000, as amended, IC serves as Executive Secretary of the PIDB and provides the PEIDB with all program and administrative support. The PIDB submitted two letters to the President in fiscal year 2023. The first supported releasing the JFK records and requiring agencies review the remaining JFK Act records to prepare transparency plans for the National Declassification Center at the National Archives. The second addressed the National Security Classification and Declassification System and provided recommendations on reforming Executive Order 13526. I will now address the items of interest from the November 15, 2023 NISPAC public meeting. The NISPAC minutes from the last meeting were certified to be true and correct and were finalized by me on February 20th, 2024 and were posted to the ISU website on the same day. One of the actions that will be discussed by DCSA later in the meeting, where they will provide further clarification on open storage approvals and share draft documents as appropriate. The second, second action item was related to the NIST poem. It went out for public comment. DOD has addressed all the comments received. And once again to OMB, they will send it out for interagency review. It will be requested that OMB shares it with the government NISPAC members, but ultimately it's up to OMB who they send the draft to. They will also consider pending leadership approval, the possibility of issuing the NISPOM amendment for review by the NISPAC. Do any NISPAC members have any questions? Ms. Evans, is anyone raising their hand on the phone line or sent a question via chat? Not at this time. Thank you. At this time, we will now introduce our speakers for our updates. Mr. Isaiah Rivers, the NISPAC industry spokesperson, will provide the industry update. Ike? Uh, good morning. Can you hear me, Heather? Yes, sir, I can. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and happy hump day to all. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to be able to provide the National Industrial Security Program NIST policy impacts from an industry perspective today. Um, there has definitely been a lot of moving parts within the industry and government since our last public meeting in November um, to include a stand up of an, a new improved industry NISPAC physical security working group, um, which I think is going to pay dividends. Uh, in, in the near future. And industry has definitely been extremely actively involved monitoring all the moving parts of the NIST that may have an, an impact on the industrial industrial base. Um, today, industry NISPAC members will provide, um, along with myself, a few of the topics being monitored, tracked, and worked by industry NISPAC members and now industrial associate, associations. Um, I want to share something with you. Recently, I read an article written by Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Air Force General um, C.Q. Brown, who called for an increased togetherness and collaboration between government and industry. And he said, 
and he stated something that resonates with this particular group in particular. When it comes to the government and our defense industry partners, the only way to ensure our national security is to work together. Um, together, we need to be willing to put all the cards on the table, the good, the bad, and the ugly, so we can work together on solutions. Um, this is why I love this particular group of individuals, because everyone on this call is willing to do whatever it takes to protect the warfighter in this particular great country. Um, I do want to personally thank ISU and Heather Pagan for all their continued partnership and keeping industry updated on all the relative pertinent information. Um, we can't do our jobs without you, so thank you so much for, for being there for us. Before we move on to a few topics um, that I mentioned earlier um, that industry has been monitoring, I want to piggyback on what Heather said earlier regarding that industry NISPAC will be soon starting the solicitation process for nominations and selection process for two new industry NISPAC members, and we'll have a proposed member nominations to the chair no later than September 1, 2024. With that being said, I need to recognize two industry NISPAC members whose terms will be up before we have our next public meeting in the fall. Um, Mr. Derek Jones from MIT Lincoln Lab, who is our current industry NISPAC policy working group chair, and Ms. Tur and Ms. Tracy Durkin from Mantec, who is our current industry NISPAC clearance working group chair. The both of them have paved the way in the industry for others to follow and they have been true pillars in the industry community. And on behalf of the industry, I just wanna say thanks for all you have done and will continue to do keeping our great country safe. Um, we will be electing two new members uh, that will be replacing them and you will we'll get the chance to meet those two lucky members in the fall of the public meeting. Um, we also uh, had some very important changes. And so you can, if you can go to the next slide, changes in our industri industry, NISPAC MOU personnel. And uh, most folks have the slides there or in your email. So you can just kind of take a look at those slides. Um, but I wanna go right to the topic that I mentioned earlier. Um, the first two topics that uh, I'm gonna talk about that's on my list, and then I'll pass it over to my teammates. Um, is SEI indoctrinations authority and some IC poly issues updates. Um, and then I'll pass the mic over to the industry uh, NISPAC members for topics. I um, want to address the following. Um, uh, I think it was last year, industry is aware that there has been an attempt to move towards getting DOD components. And this is in regards to SEI uh, indoctrination. Industry is aware that there has been an attempt moving forward, getting DOD components to allow industry to conduct SEI indoctrination to lessen the gov government's work burden and to speed time, time to mission. Um, we also recall DDI Dixon's comment during the fall NDIA AIA conference to, to engage with DOD component, components on this matter. While we appreciate the letter of support from last summer reminding the components of this capability, we are wondering if you have any concrete movement to report regarding this important process and mission improvement. From a polygraph perspective, we all know polys are taking a long time. What are the agencies doing to hire more polygraph examiners to assist in improving the timeline timeliness receiving a polygraph, thus decreasing the overhead charges incurred by the industry and getting employees on programs faster to meet our customers' requirements. Um, now I want to turn this over to Tracy Durkin um, regarding some information sharing questions. Hi, Ike. Um, first of all, thank you for your kind words. Um, it has certainly been a pleasure to serve the NISPAC these last four years, and and you can't get rid of me that easy. I definitely will still be around to support the working groups and all of you. Um, one of the things that um, I wanted to bring up was I know ODNI is working on a policy 
for an approach for overhead clearances. Overhead clearances is an issue for industry and it has been for quite some time. There's, there's no consistency on how they are offered or provided. And sometimes it comes down to the relationship that you have with that particular customer. Currently, some agencies are not providing any additional overhead clearances at all. Even when somebody leaves, they, they're not doing a one-for-one -one swap, which is a huge issue. We're hoping that when ODNI comes out with a policy or some guidance for implementation, that it will be more consistent across the board. CUI, um, I brought this up in the clearance working group. It's inconsistent in guidance across the agencies and implementation, but is ODNI okay with the fact that some of the agencies have put in writing that they will not participate with CUI? This may seen it again in consistency across the board. And then the last thing, um, in the clearance working group, I brought up that um, GSA, the process was sometimes difficult to understand and how to, to set up accounts to order space. And we had some concerns with backlog, but um, the, the VOI that DCSA is putting out, um, the upcoming one, has great information on GSA and how to obtain and purchase space. So I had nothing more um, on that topic. So uh, now that I will turn it over to Derek Jones. All right, thank you very much, Tracy. Um, this is Derek Jones, uh, Industry NISPAC. Like, I also wanted to say thank you for your, your comments. Um, like Tracy, you won't be getting rid of me uh, that fast. Uh, continue to support you know, working group member capacity for sure going forward. Uh, so today, um, I do have two questions uh, to cover. Uh, but first, I, I did wanna say how much Industry NISPAC appreciates the, uh, the partnership and communication. Um, as Ike has, has been recently saying, uh, we are certainly better together. So thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, these two questions are uh, are specific to uh, to Matt and Keith, DCSA. Um, I'm happy to to list both questions, and then if uh, if we want to do a response now or if a response later, e either way is fine. Just let me know. Uh, but question one is to see if there's an update to the designated official, senior management official. Um, process. Uh, it's also worth noting, uh, by the way, that we really appreciate being able to review the draft job aid. That was a, a number of weeks ago. Uh, again, you know, the communication and partnership has been awesome. And then question two is just an update on the DCSA 147 form and implementation plan. Uh, so again, uh, leave it up to the group if uh, the group wants to answer questions now or, or wait till afterwards. But those are the two questions that I had to share uh, with the group today. Thank you. I'll return it over to Greg Sadler. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, the one one I ready to touch on is uh, NCCS is the newest, um, I guess, tool in the DCSA arsenal when it comes to um, better engagement and tracking of 254s and, and the NISP um, activities and functions. Um, one area where we've got increasing interest from an industry perspective is what is that onboarding pace for government industry uh, from a user perspective? Uh, as we know, the process is, is quite uh, manual just due to resources, resource constraints um, in that, that pipeline, but also an, an interesting metric that we wanna be able to, to partner on is what is the agency, the user agency adoption of NCCS our clause has been in place. We know that it is the path that everyone needs to execute to. But as industry, we're kind of waiting in the uh, with the catcher's mitt, uh, not knowing when the pitch is going to really start coming through from the respective organizations. So that emphasis on on what that pace is looking like from a government perspective would be very valuable. Um, other uh, within the NISA working group that. Engagement continues to remain strong with DCSA um, and open to all the other CSAs across the community for any information assurance risk management uh, framework, um, any of those engagements where we can better partner to, to improve policy adherence, improve the safety and security of our infrastructures. Uh, we're 100% engaged on that within the DCSA structure uh, and 
Dave Scott, please forgive me. I'm just not getting the organizational name rolling off the tip of my tongue yet, but uh, we're looking forward to the formal coordination of the DAPM, uh, get that feedback and, and the rewrite moving forward through the official process. And then also continued engagement on cloud infrastructure and the ability for industry to use that environment to better the mission, um, but also want to start looking at how to improve the maturity and then the capabilities that are available within that environment. We know that that's a, a, both a guidance and a policy area of, of concern. So we want to partner and continue to mature that environment. So with that, I will uh, transition over to Ms. Kathy Andrews. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, everybody. Due to the concerns um, from industry regarding the implementation of Tempest guidelines, uh, NISPAC requested the creation of a new working group. Um, and as Ike mentioned, um, the title of that is Physical Security Working Group. But given our, our initial uh, task of trying to resolve and create consistent policy for us regarding the ICD 705 Tempest guidelines. So our first meetings this afternoon, I'm confident we'll be ready for a public session in short order. Um, given that this has been a concern for over a year, our role right now is really to pull together all of the industry concerns and present them from one source. We have a, a strong group of subject, subject matter experts um, that I'm sure will allow us to do that in, in very quick order. And we look forward to working with you on developing a consistent plan for industry to follow to ensure that we can provide the necessary protection that's needed for our mission. So back over to you, Ike. All right, all right, thank you, Kathy. Um, um, I hope uh, uh, Mariana or Mariana Martineau or Mark Fraunfelter is on. Uh, and so maybe uh, during the call, they can give us an update on the sharing covered inside of threat information pertaining to contract employees uh, in the national security workforce. I know during the last public meeting um, that uh, we asked that question and they were working on some timelines. And so uh, it would be nice for industry to see um, where we're at with those timelines as that, that subject is, is increasingly become very common and it's being asked a lot about by industry so uh it would be nice to have some information um in the in the deep near future to share with the industry on how that's coming along um lastly during the last public meeting um, um i kind of mentioned that industry well not just me mentioning but i know jeff spinninger mentioned it as well that industry NISPAC will, would love to have a regular cadence with the CSAs um, just to talk about how we can collaborate better and work on any issues that may arise and not just wait for the public meeting uh, to address um, those items. Um, I truly think that uh, industry NISPAC and the CSAs can accomplish a lot more if we had reg regular um, cadence. And I think both the government and industry will, and I don't think, I know both government and industry will benefit from those regular cadence. So industry NISPAC is willing to, to throw hands up and host the first session at one of our locations in the DMV area. Um, we would love for it to be in person, um, but we will take what we can get. If it's a Zoom call, a Teams call, a dialing, we'll do that. Um, I will do my very, very best um to try to do whatever i can from industry NISPAC perspective to try to make that happen um industry looks forward to assisting our government partners in understanding our challenges so that collectively we can work on viable solutions so that industries at large can meet the NIST regulatory requirements to ensure our company viability in the u.s and global markets and maintain a viable secure supply chain so that we can get to balance and approach and protecting our national security. Um, Heather, Gunn, uh, as always, I wanna thank you very much um, for uh, allowing us this opportunity uh, to speak on behalf of the industry. Uh, as I always say, this is a great forum for us to collaborate and partner 
um, to protect our great country. And like I always says, when it comes to the government and industry, we are indeed better together. So over to you, Heather. Thank you, Ike. I really appreciate those kind words. Are there any questions from any NISPAC members for Ike or any of the other NISPAC members that spoke? Candice, do we have any questions in the queue? Not at this time. Thank you. All right, we'll move on now to Mr. Jeffrey Spinninger, the Director of the Information and Acquisition Protection Directorate for the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. He will give the update on behalf of DOD as the NIST Executive Agent. Jeff? Good morning. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, I'm ha happy for the opportunity to participate again today. Uh, with quite a bit to cover, um, but before I, I do, um, you know, really just to begin, I'd, I'd like to pick up and, and echo, uh, you know, well, well, frankly, all the comments that Ike and, uh, and, and the industry members made, but but particularly that need for, you know, for, for uh, you know, um, increased, uh, you know, collaboration. So I can name the, the, the venue and the time uh, we can hopefully look, uh, you know, a little bit like two weeks or more into the future, uh, our calendars are quite fluid, but but for that, um, uh, you definitely have our support. And, I'm, and I imagine I can I can speak on most of the, the, the DOD personnel who are on the call today. Uh, we can't get where our our leaders expect us to go without uh, without the outstanding support uh, that that NISPAC industry uh, you know has always provided. That's that's been my experience. Uh, and with that in mind, I, I really uh, would like to then offer my uh, congratulations and thanks to uh, to Derek and, Tr and Tracy, uh, you know, for their participation. It's hard to believe that it's, <clears throat> it's been four years, um, but uh, it, uh, time does fly. Uh, but thank you very much for the the, the strong and patient voices that you uh, that you have had, and uh, I'm happy to hear that you'll you'll continue to be part of uh, the mix. Uh, with that, uh, you know, we welcome the opportunity for for new participation and keep that steady, uh, you know, flow of uh, of of, uh, of you know incredibly important um, perspective uh, of what our policies look like in execution. Uh, so uh, so we'll look forward to see uh, to see those new members as they come aboard. Um, and then uh, most importantly, and and uh, if you'll indulge me, just a personal moment. Uh, you know, I definitely want to wish uh, you know uh, you know Keith Minard. Uh, you know, um, the, what our Navy friends would say, fair winds and following seas. Um, I, I, I imagine just about everybody on here, and I was kind of cycling through, there's a, a number of, in, of of government folks who have uh, taken various roles across the NISPAC, uh, across federal agencies. Uh, each of us uh, has benefited uh, because we all uh, have in the middle of our constellations uh, time with Keith uh, Minard. Uh, he's, per, he's patient, he's professional, um, he's a pretty good breakfast companion. And, uh, and and I'm told he can shoot straight. So uh, so so we uh, we will miss him, uh, but we'll look forward. At, somehow I I don't think he's going to just kind of shy away someplace. I don't I don't think that's in his nature. And so we'll look forward to uh, to what comes next. But thanks very much, Keith, uh, both from the department and uh, and then frankly from me personally. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to address just a few things that were raised by industry before I go into the balance of my remarks. And and really again thanking you for. For calling out, uh, you know, uh, you know what our a list of of open items, uh, you know, the list um, we never seem to get to zero, uh, and we're 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 getting a little bit longer in some of them, and I, I really think that's a, an, an underscore for the need for uh, you know for for maybe a bit more steady drumbeat. Uh, we certainly welcome the opportunity for these forum, uh, as I've mentioned many times before, the opportunity to be on the record uh, creates a level of understanding and frankly some accountability to address issues. I can't promise the outcome, uh, but I can promise the follow through, and that's the thing that uh, that we're working on today, uh, and that that I want to just briefly touch on on some of the topics that were that were brought up. Uh, the first one on the SEI index. Thank you very much for for uh, you know for for uh, remembering and recalling uh, you know that uh, based on industry uh, you know uh, bringing this to our attention uh, you know doing doing quite a bit of legwork, really kind of scoping uh, you know the issue and and uh, and giving some sense of what the impacts can look like. Uh, you know, as was mentioned, uh, you know, my boss, uh, John Dixon, um, uh, uh, you know, issued a, a guidance, what we call a guidance memo, right, basically uh, out to the components to remind them of an authority that has always existed, uh, which is the ability to delegate authority for indoctrination. 
Uh, in the time period since then, uh, you know, we, you know, we, we turn uh, maybe not at the pace that industry would like, but the prior, the wheels do turn. Uh, and through what we call the Defense Security Enterprise, John uh, has a pretty long title. Uh, he, uh, if any of you were at uh, NSI this morning, you would have heard uh, the, 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 you know, he's the Director for Defense Intelligence, Counterintelligence, Law Enforcement, and Security, which works out to be about an 11 by 14 business card. Um, but a little bit uh, more more uh, abrupt, he is the defense security executive, uh, which is a which is a term of, of art defined in, in DoD policy. Uh, and as the defense security uh, executive, on behalf of the undersecretary, he chairs uh, what is called the, the defense security enterprise ex uh, executive committee. Uh, so and so in the time period since he uh, issued the the memo, uh, reminding folks what we've done uh, is then kind of cast a net the next layer uh, in, in, in engaged at his level across uh, the primary components here, the military departments, the IC elements, uh, where most of the, uh, you know, I think the, the current challenge areas have. And while that ends up being, you know, seven or eight or ten, uh, you know, senior officials sitting around a table, um, those are constellations under themselves, you know, uh, 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 in, um, you know, each of the military departments is, uh, is is quite expansive, and so being able to kind of work down into and understand uh, wh where or why uh, a, you know components are not electing to utilize the discretion that they have is where we find ourselves today. And so while that means that we aren't maybe uh, you know seeing a, a major drop in the numbers, um, I think the thing that's important to realize is our 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 you know we can't just direct that to happen. Uh, that is not that's that's not the way the department is configured, and and I don't think anybody would want it to, to be that way. Security programs have to be decentralized in order to be effective, uh, and that's something that is uh, I, I I I think is is quite important, and I'm I'm sure most uh, if not all would uh, would agree with that. Uh, you know, but for that, uh, by putting it out there this way, and then uh, and then asking uh, you know his counterparts across the components that are are most. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, in the midst of this issue, uh, you know, brings uh, what is the most important to us, and that is, is some data and perspective, uh, and 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 we'll work work that out. We are looking uh, forward to the next Defense Security Enterprise XCOM is is in the is in the month of June, so we're a little bit out of phase in terms of formal updates, but in the run up to that, we anticipate some uh, some some substance, and so I'm happy to put myself on on the hook uh, to be able to provide, um, you know, what the data picture looks from the government side so we can do some comparison with what industry has provided to us already. Um, on the poly front, thank you very much for that. Uh, so so um, uh, for, for reasons not completely known to me, um, uh, uh, I uh, was given another initiative back in the fall and, and uh, uh, with respect to polygraph. And if I'm being very frank on a call for which every word I say is recorded, uh, I was a little, um, a little uh, intimidated by it, but I'm actually happy to have it because as we have uh, delved into and understand uh, better, you know, the nature of what we see um, with respect to polygraph uh, across the department or credibility assessments uh, more generally, um, there's a ton of opportunity here, both uh, in the baseline, uh, what was alluded to on the in the question from today, right? You know, the timeliness of the current processes. But also with an eye for the future, it's it's 2024. Uh, there are some opportunities to, to leverage technologies uh, related to credibility assessments that uh, that we think there's uh, there's there's room for for greater exploration, and uh, and that is something that my leadership uh, at, uh, uh, above uh, John uh, have have prioritized for us. Uh, and so I will uh, be happy. I, I literally have a meeting on this very topic tomorrow. I will be happy to. Uh, be able to introduce, uh, a, you know, uh, an overview or add to what my uh, the the way that the meeting will go tomorrow to reflect, uh, you know, how industry is seeing this and the drag on on uh, on on you know support to acquisition programs uh, this uh, this presently represents. Um, CUI, how can we not mention CUI? Um, uh, I, I think I appreciated Heather's uh, comments, uh, you know, uh, early on and and in the in the, in the discussion through when industry raised it. Uh, and and I, I we would continue to echo that the department continues to move forward very incrementally. Uh, we don't want to outpace other federal agencies more than maybe we already have. Um, we are uh, act an active voice in the in the proposed revision processes uh, that are being led by the the National Security Council. And I, and I have to say, although we are a little behind the clock from where we would want to be, uh, these are this is one of those scenarios where we can get it right or we can get it fast. 
um, but I don't think there's a, a way to do that, to do both of those. Um, along the same vein, uh, however, I, I don't think we're actually going to get to where any of us need to be uh, government or industry across agencies uh, until we can get to, uh, you know, a level of evenness uh, that, that can only be provided through a common regulation, right? So, so I appreciate um, uh, ISOO's continued very even uh, acknowledgement of where we have stood uh, since before I joined this PAC myself, uh, you know, with respect to the FAR clause. Um, but we're at a point now where the prudent course is to hold and let, let, uh, let some of the broader strategic policy work uh, get concluded uh, and, then, and, then, and then take stock of where we are. Um, with that, we continue to need uh, the, the, the voices from industry so we can balance as much as possible uh, you know, while we continue to, to, to move forward. Uh, and thank you very much for mentioning NCCS, absolutely. Um, I appreciated the, the analogy of the catcher's mitt. Uh, I love baseball analogies, but uh, at this stage of the game, from our vantage, we're still playing t-ball uh, where NCCS is concerned. And so that's a FAR requirement that's actually been on the books for quite some time. Uh, DCSA, uh, you know, has done a, an excellent body of work to, to be responsive to uh, requirements that came from across the military departments principally, but others, uh, to create, uh, you know, a system that when uh, ultimately utilized will be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a very good and valuable source of information both for DCSA's primary responsibilities but also for those of, uh, of, of those other, um, you know, um, industrial security requirements that, uh, that build upon uh, the work that DCSA does. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to have it here. I'm happy that they'll be, uh, it'll be reflected in the record. And we are continuing to, to work that um, with our acquisition partners uh, to, uh, to spread the word. But the numbers today are not, they're not nearly where they need to be, uh, and we haven't made a, a tremendous amount of progress, and I, I think I owe you the candidness of that statement uh, today. Um, thanks very much also for raising cloud uh, in, uh, you know, both, uh, again, this to me is a, a perfect case study of, of industry participation uh, and, uh, and you know, working with experts in DCSA and, uh, and the Defense Information uh, Systems Agency uh, and others uh, to really be able to understand that our policies Although it's not, uh, you know, it's not a complete straight line. There is, uh, there is, uh, there is no, you know, we, we, the impediments are are more uh, a function of uh, of 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 understanding, uh, you know, what is uh, what is, you know, still frankly emerging technology, uh, you know, at least from from an you know execution standpoint where the government's concerned. Uh, and, and as case in point, now I literally have, today uh, was literally the day that we had to make our migrations of what were. Um, share drives uh, into uh, into our first instantiation in the cloud for our unclassified systems here in the department, and so so we're we're making a lot of headway as we bring that into the industrial security program. We're still looking forward to to uh, you know to, to seeing uh, you know capitalization on, on what in in my estimation will be a, a more secure means of of achieving uh, this the, the IT requirements that that, uh, that come uh, come within the framework of the NISP. And uh, we're we're paying attention uh, and and are standing by to assist uh, you know where 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 it's necessary. At this stage of the game, however, I think the best thing uh, from from our vantage uh, that we can do is is allow the work to continue, allow uh, what DCSA has set up uh, in motion and 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 in, in great collaboration with this to continue to play out. Um, uh, if uh, if we need calibration on that, look forward to it and, and maybe those sessions that I alluded to. And then finally, uh, from the industry comments on the FISEC. Yeah, thank you very much for raising that. Right, you know, understanding, you know, we we uh, we have um, you know um, we have have some real challenges here. Uh, you know, we're on an open line, uh, which which maybe uh, precludes some of the the frankness that we have. But this is an issue. It's it's a it's a pretty big issue. I don't think it's fully defined. And the remedy isn't just the straight you know straight legs. You know, everybody gets to you know the, the, you know whatever whatever the the baseline needs to be. Right. The conversation needs to be more detailed than that. And, um, but it needs to be detailed in, in two different ways, uh, and, and, and I think the way that really kind of was first, uh, you know, uh, introducing this to my leadership happened at the last uh, NDIA and AIA. Uh, there was a session where, you know, uh, several of the larger companies really kind of created the first uh, kind of, um, you, you know, just sort of generalized uh, impact statements that came out there. We, we, we need a little bit more detail than that. But we also need to provide a bit more detail to really characterize the challenges uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the whys. And so I think uh, 
again, with ISU's um, you know, facilitation, being able to bring that together uh, in, in this new, new working group is going to be important. But I think we're going to want to move pretty fast. So I hope this is one of those, uh, those I, the items that maybe becomes almost the number one item on the agenda uh, you know, for where we stand, what have we done uh, between now and, and the next time we're on the record here uh, at the next NISPAC. And so um, finally, uh, a few things that we wanted to make sure that we were going to you know, cover and, and provide updates on as we have continued to do uh, over the last several NISPACs. Uh, the first one uh, being an update on, on the expansive requirements uh, that were given to the department uh, regarding uh, uh, FOCI assessments, uh, you know, capitalizing on, on the baseline requirements, the longstanding requirements for FOCI pursuant to the Industrial Security Program. Uh, but expanding that quite extensively uh, for all department uh, contracts and subcontracts greater than $5 million. Um, as, as I have said before, that's not, not altogether hard to write as a function of statute, um, but it gets, it gets uh, the closer you get to the mission, the, the, the more complex this can become. And so we've been in quite deliberate uh, trying to allow some uh, time for DCSA to build its initial program and then beginning to, to advocate and, uh, and re resource to, uh, to, to, to have that plan uh, able to execute when the policy and, uh, and uh, begin, uh, you know, goes live. Uh, we're pretty much inside the five yard line at this time period and um, I never want to presuppose the outcome and, and, uh, and, and um, uh, uh, more than one time the ball gets fumbled uh, as you're crossing the goal so I don't want to I don't want to bias that uh, that that, uh, that we're done, but we're we're as close as we have been. Uh, it is, it, it, and uh, and I'm and I'm optimistic, uh, which means that all of the baseline work is done, and the real work will will begin. Uh, I think we're in a pretty good space to be able to start that process. DCSA has done uh, yeoman's work to build a plan that uh, and a and a pathway to be able to uh, to to, uh, to to con to consider. Uh, and get after the, the broad scope of, of what this requirement looks like. Uh, as soon as we get the policy issued, uh, we will we'll take a breath for about five minutes, and then we will turn our attention to our acquisition partners on the DFAR process that will actually underwrite this, uh, the, the, the requirements. Uh, again, we will not be able to do that without active participation from, uh, from this PAC industry, from those foci companies out there, but even those companies that don't uh, have, have extensive experience with FOCI, we're going to need to hear from you as well. Uh, I was pleased to have a conversation this afternoon with an industry, or excuse me, this morning with an industry member, uh, you know, regarding a, a really interesting question. Uh, if, uh, if I have, um, if I have a FOCI mitigation agreement in place with another CSA uh, and I want to do business with the Department of Defense, uh, what, what, will, what will A47 look like? And that becomes a real-time case study example for us. Uh, that uh, that and others uh, will inform what this looks like in implementation. Um, we have a, a lot of policy work to do. That's uh, that's really the balance of the the, the remaining my remaining remarks. Uh, it, uh, first and foremost, uh, for this group uh, is is the re reissuance of the DoD manual for the NISP uh, for government activities. Uh, we've been working on this, uh, you know, very deliberately for quite some time since the uh, since the rule for the NISPOM was uh, was was completed. Um, we are um, right now working on some uh, substantive updates uh, that relate to that. Um, they run the gamut from from uh, from fairly uh, benign issues like the name change uh, from DSS to DCSA uh, through the incorporation of the requirements for NCCS. Uh, just to beat that drum a little bit. Uh, and incorporating the joint venture facility clearance requirements that are reflected in legislation, and, and then a litany of others uh, that, uh, that that keep Allison, Renzella, and uh, and Glenn Clay uh, more than more than occupied in their in their day. Um, we uh, we intend for the draft to be shared with internal stakeholders uh, within the, under the INS constellation. Chris, me, that's the third time today I've said that. Um, to include DCSA uh, by the beginning of June. Uh, following which it'll go out to NISPAC uh, government uh, members uh, into the coordination process. Um, our only ask at this time period is that we expedite that, um, do this uh, on this forum here, because uh, although this is, uh, this is directions to the government, uh, the impacts to industry, I think, are obvious. And so uh, I, I put this out here so that, again, uh, when, we're next, uh, when we're all next together and on the record, uh, I hope our update will be uh, 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 quite a bit more um, uh, closer to the goal line uh, than uh, than we are we stand today. 
Uh, along those same lines, uh, uh, um, we, are, we are in the closing stretches of the joint venture DPM um, uh, uh, directive type memorandum, uh, you know, which, uh, which, which is intended to, uh, uh, you know, to, to build on the ISU notice. Um, thank you again for that. Um, you know, and guide, you know, to, to help to level the bubble uh, where the small business federal rule is. Um, this is important. That, that, that was an important step for us to clarify the, the, the provisions between the NISP rule and the, and the Small Business Administration. Um, and, and so we, we're closing in on that. Again, this is, this is a lot of regulatory stuff, and, and although it relates to security, it's a whole lot more of a legal uh, suite of questions. And um, I, I'm not sure I, 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 um, I was going to make a joke about lawyers. I'm not going to do that because I remember that we're on the record. But suffice it to summarize that, you know, that, that our security-minded lawyers uh, in, in, in close concert with their acquisition, you know, cadre have really kind of noodled, noodled through this, and, and, uh, and, and we're, we're, we're quite close. Uh, I will say uh, this is creating some real challenges within um, one or, uh, or several of the military components who, who, uh, who are completely affected by this imbalance. Uh, we feel that imperative, and if you happen to be one of those companies out there affected by that, uh, this has not been off of our top five list uh, since the since the issue um, you know was first raised to our attention uh, almost two years ago. Um, and so finally, uh, as this along the policy front, uh, again, those of you who know um, and are familiar, you know, uh, you, you know, we're we're literally at the anniversary of of what was a pretty um, substantial, significant event. Uh, that that happened, uh, frankly, uh, you know, within the department, but affects all of us uh, who do national security work and and have responsibilities to safeguard classified information. Of course, I'm referring uh, to the unauthorized disclosure uh, by uh, by Jack Teixeira. Uh, you know, the work that the department undertook here to one understand and and provide context and support of DOJ uh, investigations and the and the prosecution, uh, you know, for crimes committed. Uh, obviously, that was a, a mainstay work for us, but the broader work that was laid out were a series of imperatives that were established by, uh, frankly, the Secretary of Defense, uh, you know, both in, in, in assessing the security posture of the department and then taking steps to, to ensure that the accountability uh, measures that are necessary to ensure safeguarding uh, and, and hold the line on, uh, you know, on, on, on both and making sure that information gets where it needs to, but in a way that's secure. Uh, has led to us to, to really um, to, to, uh, to, to, to take stock of what we call security in depth. Uh, what that means to this uh, forum uh, is that well, the policy revisions that I just mentioned, those that Heather alluded to earlier, there's been a heavy um, you know, emphasis, uh, you know, frankly, at the top of the government uh, examining how we do uh, and conduct information security, uh, you know, from CUI to special access uh, and everything in the middle. Uh, you know, along the, uh, what that means to the department, uh, there are about, believe it or not, 19 separately issued security policies that govern information security, uh, which is really fun if information security is in your portfolio. All 19 of those policies have been identified and prioritized for, uh, for, for revision. Um, that is uh, no small undertaking, um, any, any, any of you all who are students of policy, but, it, but it's also uh, quite important. Uh, as we continue to move forward, each of those will have some effect uh, and, 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 and will be, uh, have a ripple effect, uh, you know, as it relates to industry. And so we'll need to continue to have and ask for your active voice uh, as, as those play forward uh, to the extent we, we can and meet the timelines and the expectations of our leader staff those issues. Um, so uh, with that, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Do any NISPAC members have any questions for Jeff? All right, how are we looking on questions, Candace? Anyone with their hand raised or in chat? There's no one in queue at this time. Thank you. We will now hear from Mr. Matthew Roach, the Division Chief of the NISP Operations for Industrial Security for the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. Matt, over to you. Hey, good morning, and thank you, uh, um, Heather, for all the work you've done putting this meeting together. I'm going to go rather quickly, considering that the uh, time hack that we're on here is uh, 1100 um, already. So uh, today I'm going to provide a, a little uh, update, talk about some senior personnel changes, 
Uh, but first, I want to say say thank you, excuse me, to Tracy Durkin for her service on the um, this PAC industry working group, and to Ike and his leadership as we uh, progress through some of these difficult um, uh, challenges. And it, and I could not agree more. Um, that it's better together. So thank you, Ike, and thank you, Tracy. Look forward to continuing our, our collaboration, even if it's not in this capacity. Uh, so personnel changes. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, our new director, um, Director David M. Catler. He's been on board since uh, around March 24th, and he regrets not being able to attend today's meeting. Um, but has already made it a priority to engage with NISPAC members, as you know, uh, with ISU members, industry leaders, and other key DCSA stakeholders and partners. And he looks uh, forward to being a uh, uh, a key uh, a key uh, fixture in these meetings, these NISPAC meetings going forward. Uh, so a little bit about Mr. Catler. He brings to the agency an extensive background in the intelligence community having served multiple times with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, leading complex efforts across organizational and functional boundaries. He has significant collection management and analytic experience at the national joint and service level. He's advised the president, civilian agencies, the department, and uh, military leaders, as well as operational forces. Uh, most recently, he served as the NATO Assistant Secretary General for Intelligence and Security. Um, in addition to a number of early priorities for the agency and his tenure as DCSA Director, Mr. Catler has outlined three key strategic goals for DCSA. First, establishing the agency as the recognized premier provider of integrated security services and preferred partner in the security services mission space. Second, ensuring the agency is operating at full performance across all missions. After five years of consolidation and transformation, we need to move beyond the startup phase. The public and our stakeholders have a number of reasonably high expectations for the agency and we need to be delivering on them in full. And lastly, preparing the agency to execute its mission into the future. The director is challenging the DCSA team to look at 2040 as a benchmark, asking what will be the threat and mission environment um, look like at that time in 2040? What will DCSA need to look like to operate in that changed environment? Mr. Catler will be innovative in our approaches to addressing our missions because we simply cannot expect that we will be able to increase budgets and staffing indefinitely to match increasing demands on the agency. Uh, and in closing, uh, Mr. Catler wishes to, uh, uh, to address the partners in industry that engagement is key. He looks forward to listening, learning, and working together in support of our shared national security goal. So uh, again, my pleasure to introduce Mr. Catler to all of you. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there'll be other uh, senior personnel changes uh, highlighted in, in the remarks. I'll be followed by Mike Fowler. But first, I'd just like to cover a quick uh, few operational updates, um, talk about metrics, the security review rating process, uh, open storage form 147 approval, um, the uh, designated official and the senior management official lexicon change, uh, and um, uh, won't get too far into those, but just quickly, CCSA set a goal of conducting 3,400 security reviews in fiscal year 24. We're making steady progress toward achieving that goal, and we're right now about 60% uh, through today uh, in achieving that overall goal. This, uh, this puts us on pace uh, to, to achieve that by the end of the FY. Uh, so far, we got around 75% of the facilities reviewed are satisfactory with an additional 18% commendable. 
uh, and that leaves about 7% superior. Uh, this is consistent with the trends we've seen in the past, um, and it's a great news story and speaks very well to all of our education and outreach that a large majority of our industry partners are compliant with the NIST or better. Excuse me. So uh, the 147 form, I appreciate uh, uh, industry NIST PACs engagement on this uh, combined effort. We've been working collaboratively in the last year, uh, and we will continue to make those final adjustments to the form in the process in a collaborative way um, in the near future. Uh, but we have been engaged uh, since uh, about this time last year uh, in, in improving uh, those uh, open storage area uh, appro uh, approval forms 147. Uh, so the security rating score, it was about a year ago to, uh, this month that the uh, DCSA uh, set out on an endeavor with the industry NISPAC uh, to improve how the security rating score uh, is determined. <clears throat> Two key, two key refinements uh, include incorporating a numeric score and clarifying uh, the criteria requirements um, and coming to a, uh, an agreement on what those key definitions are. <clears throat> the definitions being germane to the rating process, uh, what uh, certain definitions bring to uh, determining the rating and agreeing to those. So we set forth on a uh, partnership with industry, uh, formulated a working group, and we've uh, just completed the pilot phase of 40 uh, security reviews, and we're, we're uh, on track now to uh, go into a final um, effort in, de in deploying the form, hopefully in the fall. Uh, in the new fiscal year. So uh, the designated official, senior management official discussion, we have a job aid we've shared with uh, industry, uh, and we will um, move from there to a collaborative discussion on how we best communicate that further um, to the wider audience. And <clears throat> lastly, the uh, uh, NCCS, there'll be more information to follow on that as well. But all of these issues, we will continue to update this PAC industry uh, in a timely and efficient way. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Mike Fowler. Hey, thank you, Matt. And good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Mike Fowler with the NBIS Planning and Deployment Office. I have several updates uh, for the ENVIS uh, program today, uh, but first I want to echo uh, Matt's uh, comments and, and just reinforce our appreciation to industry uh, for their continued partnership with us uh, as far as ENVIS testing, deployment, and uh, all things go. Um, we definitely could not achieve what we have uh, without the industry partnership. Uh, so we certainly appreciate that and look forward to continue, continuing that, uh, that work together. The three items I'm going to cover today, uh, we're going to cover uh, some of the ENVIS recovery efforts. Uh, we're going to cover ENVIS version updates and also some recent leadership changes within the ENVIS program. So first, uh, ENVIS recovery efforts. So DOD and DCSA coordinated ENVIS recovery plan actions to address cost, schedule, and performance challenges and have begun to revitalize the ENVIS program. Uh, the completion of this recovery effort will result in a stabilized program set to implement an updated ENVIS product roadmap. There are several major Trusted Workforce 2.0 milestones to include the March 2025 target for implementation of the three-tiered framework. This will refine and reflect the updated ENVIS roadmap. Once complete, the Trusted Workforce 2.0 milestones will be updated and published to reflect the new roadmap. In the meantime, DCSA will continue to offer shared services, maintain current operational capabilities, 
and continue to work to enhance EAP and case initiation capabilities. Uh, we also placed an article in the March Voice of Industry available on the DCSA website uh, that covers Envis recovery as well uh, for public consumption. Uh, also, next uh, are Envis version updates. Uh, we have updated Envis version 4.6, 4.61, and 4.63, effective March 28, 2024. In these versions, uh, they have included updates and improvements to the initiation, review, and authorization, otherwise known as IRA, capability to include assignment, form routing, reporting, and notification. An official notice has been posted on the NBIS news page on the DCSA public website, which includes a fact sheet and a detailed list of system updates, as well as links to knowledge articles in the security training, education, and professional portal, otherwise known as STEP. Um, the title of that document is Upcoming IRA uh, Capability Deployment 4.6, 4.61, and 4.63. Um, this is something that we are planning to continue uh, to do for each NBIS release. We will be posting that information on the NBIS news page, on our public website, and placing the updates within STEP uh, for everybody uh, to see and, and review. Uh, finally, a couple of leadership updates. Uh, in addition to the appointment of Mr. David Catler as the new director of DCSA, effective March 24th, DCSA has also onboarded a new program executive officer, an NBIS executive program manager, and a deputy PM. The new PEO is Mr. Edward Lane, who comes to us from the Defense Intelligence Agency, where he served as the deputy senior acquisition executive. His appointment was effective April 22nd. The new NBIS executive program manager is Mr. Robert Shady who comes to us from the United States Army, where he served as the acting deputy PEO Enterprise Information Systems. His appointment was effective March 10th. And finally, uh, a new deputy, NBIS deputy program manager is Mr. Lindley Earl, who was also onboarded on April 22nd. Um, that is the updates that we have for NBIS. Pending any questions, I will turn it back to Mr. Matt Roach. Thank you, Mike. At this time, I'd like to take a, a few minutes to recognize Keith Minard and his contributions to the National Dust Security Program. I uh, can't say enough about that, but I know that uh, all of us feel the same way and that we'll miss Keith. But I wanted to give Keith an, a moment to uh, to offer his parting comments. Hey, thanks, Matt. I want to thank everybody on the NISPAC, uh, past and present and future. It's been a great opportunity. It's been humbling to be able to serve in a role um, for quite a few years that affect the national security program. Um, it is a team sport. Industry talked about this, about partnership. Not one of us actually makes the NISP work alone. It takes industry, government, and a wide range of activities activities to actually make this program work and make it effective. I, I know that the DCSA, DCSA team is on board on the call right now and that we manage for this will continue to provide the high level of support to the NISPAC. And again, thanks everybody for your comments and it, it has been a tremendous experience for the last several years. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Matt, is that all for DCSA? Yes, thanks, Heather. Thank you. Do any NISPAC members have any questions for Matt or DCSA? Ms. Evans, anyone in the queue or on chat? We do have one question in chat from Diana Thornton. Will you address SMO guidelines? Appears discrepancy among industry regarding who should be appointed this role. Thank you, Candice. Yep. Matt? able to take that? Yeah, I, it, without, uh, uh, you know, some additional details, whether it's a, a uh, branch or division, or it, it's probably best that we 
continue on our pathway to publish the job aid, and that job aid will provide further clarification. Okay, thank you. Hey, Heather. Uh, yes, sir. This is this is Ike from the Industry NISPAC. I'm just uh, is uh, Mr. Mike Ray on? He is. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, Hey, Mike, um, I want to address, uh, I know at the last um, clearance working group, you mentioned that you was going to give us an update at the public meeting in regards to the wrap back. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, I can uh, go ahead and address that now. Um, so uh, let me just sort of break it down here. So just for everyone's awareness, you know, wrap back, um, right, so CV, you know, biometric fingerprint, right? Criminal data source. Um, currently right now, um, we don't have the current resources or IT solutions, right? To enroll the, the 3.8 million subjects that we have into Ratback. Um, but with that being said, from a risk perspective, we are covered, okay? Um, so the DOD in this population, right? We have a robust suite of criminal data sources that trigger on a regular basis. Um, we're also capturing new fingerprints as initial investigations are completed. And we're also, we have a significant number of fingerprints captured and stored ready for us to enroll in wrap back once we're resourced and we have those IT capabilities. Um, additionally, we're, we're also working with partner agencies in the IC community, okay, that are in the middle of their wrap back implementation. Um, we're sharing best practices and looking for ways to share fingerprints to, uh, to prevent the need for multiple touches within the community. So um, I, I promise once we're ready to uh, deploy wrap back um, and have that implementation plan. Um, we're going to certainly partner with industry to get feedback, um, give industry plenty of notice, and we'll make every attempt uh, to make it as easy as possible for everyone. Thanks, Mike. Yes, sir. All right, thank hey, you. Heather, this is there... I have a quick question. Yes, please go ahead. Um, going back to the, the NBIS portion, um, it seem, seems there's a bit of a, a drift in timing and that type of thing, and I completely appreciate the, the complexity of the solution. Um, is there anything that, that industry can do um, to help tighten that in and, and drive more specifics? beyond what we're already doing with the systems working group engagements. Um, you know, really, we all want to, to push this platform forward because working in two systems for an extended amount of time is less than ideal for anybody involved. Um, so just looking for more, um, I don't know if transparency is the right word, but more uh, detail in future engagements on what can we do to help move this football? Hey, Greg. Yep, this is Mike Fowler here. I appreciate the question and, as always, appreciate the support from, from NISPAC and industry to, to help us uh, with, these, with these efforts. Uh, we, we are already getting a lot of great support from, from the industry teams uh, that we're working with. Um, part of the, as this um, recovery plan kind of fleshes out over the next several weeks, several months. Um, we will continue to, to work with our industry partners in testing, um, communication, and all other outreach um, areas. So um, there, there is some internal discussion about 30, 60, and 90-day um, milestones that we're working through uh, from the leadership perspective. Uh, as those kind of start fleshing out, we will be sure to be pulling industry in on that. Um, you know, I know we're we're scheduled to go to the NDIA next week. Uh, we'll be working with industry, um, doing the networking with them as well. So um, bringing our new executive program manager down there as well. So, you know, he'll have the opportunity to talk to some of the folks there, um, do some, you know, some introductions and things. So uh, we will continue to keep industry up to date on on everything that we we have going forward. Um, so hopefully that helps answer your question. And if not, um, happy to uh, get with you offline as well. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any other questions for DCSA? Ms. Evans, anyone else in the queue? There are no further questions in queue. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Ms. Lisa Perez, the Senior Policy Officer with the Policy and Collaboration Group in the Special Security Directorate of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Lisa? Thank you very much, and um, thanks for um, having me here today to engage with everyone. Since we last met, the personnel vetting questionnaire was approved by the White House Office of Management and Budget. This form streamlines multiple collections of information into one support of an improved experience for those completing the form. This will be an electronic only form that will be completed in an e-application system. So the DCSA is actually already working um, and will be implementing this uh, new form in their e-application system. And we, of course, will have something similar in the IC. On behalf of the Director of National Intelligence and the Security Executive Agent and the Director of the Office of Personnel Management as a Suitability and Credentialing Executive Agent, a host of Trusted Workforce 2.0 policies and implementation guidance have been jointly issued to departments and agencies and authorized investigative service providers. They include implementation and operational level guidance that cover the vetting scenarios for making upgrades and in investigations, transferring of trust, and reestablishment of trust when someone seeks to reestablish their affiliation with the federal government. Updated national training standards for background investigators and national security adjudicators that align with the Trusted Workforce 2.0 policies. Implementation guidance for the previously issued federal personnel vetting performance management standards um, that provides near-term and future targets for personnel vetting performance metrics. And lastly, implementation guidance for the Trusted Information Provider Program that ISPs may establish to approve various federal and non-federal entities as trusted providers of information to support the efficiencies in the collection and validation of information within personnel vetting. And you may have heard uh, that under Trusted Workforce 2.0, an annual vetting appraisal may be required to assist in identifying individuals who may need additional support or assistance to prevent a behavior from presenting a serious future concern. So the Office of the Director of National Intelligence is continuing to work within the Trusted Workforce 2.0 reform framework to develop a pathway forward for the community. And I would love to be able to provide more information at this time, but I simply just don't have it. Um, so until our next meeting, uh, we encourage you to stay abreast of progress in the implementation of the Trusted Workforce 2.0 um, implementation by reviewing the Trusted Workforce 2.0 implementation progress reports that are posted on the performance.gov website every quarter. And uh, Tracy uh, Durkin earlier brought up a question about the implementation of controlled and classified information um, within the intelligence community. So uh, as Heather explained earlier uh, in this meeting, back in June 2022, a memo was issued by the White House National Security Council titled Initiating a Process to Review Information Management and Classification Policies. So the memorandum informed departments and agencies of a review to consider updating both IEOs 13526 for classified national security information and Executive Order 13556 controlled unclassified information, and it asks that any efforts to overhaul information management, classification, and declassification policies, including the CUI, uh, be placed on hold during this deliberation. So ODNI is awaiting the conclusion of the review, um, as other departments and agencies have selected to do. So for more information as it relates to the controlled unclassified information, ISOO did issue a CUI notice, um, number 2022-01, um, which is available on their NARA website. Um, but additionally, as Heather also mentioned earlier, um, questions to be directed to the National Security Council, as this is a review they are leading the effort on. Um, so we were also asked a question previously about the standard form 312, which was approved by the DNI. Um, an update to that was approved, I apologize, um, by the DNI, and it will allow for digital signatures where authorized. So GSA continues to work um, 
through the process to update for inclusion into their library. So they have it, they're working on it. Um, as soon as it's um, updated, the link that's available on our website will be updated. Um, and uh, also we were asked about a form 4414. Just wanted to let you know that it's undergoing update here at ODNI at this time. And currently it is approved version, um, the, excuse me, the currently approved version is available on our website, as is the link for the SF312, at least the one that's currently available on the GSA website. And so ODNI um, has been pleased to have Mariana Martineau on a joint duty assignment from the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. And she's leading a number of important efforts here at ODNI. Um, and has provided me with some talking points to share with you today about these efforts. And uh, I think both of these were actually questions came up about these um, from our industry uh, partners. So key management and oversight personnel security clearances for industry, Congress directed the ODNI to develop a policy directing departments and agencies to process requests for access to classified information for contractor personnel who do not, excuse me, who, who do not merit an application due to the work under a single contract. In other words, key management and oversight personnel, also known as indirect cost personnel. The ODNI worked with industry representatives to understand the challenges they experience and noted in this process there is a wide variation across departments and agencies to how key management and oversight personnel are cleared or not. So as our industry uh, NISPAC members explained earlier, variations create inefficiencies in contractor operations which increase costs and potentially raise the risk of inadvertent disclosure. Because indirect cost functions support all contracts and not singular programs or contracts, contractors are in the best position to assess their corporate needs for access to classified information across the classified contracts, excuse me, across all classified contractors. So there's a clear expectation that requests for access will be kept to the minimum necessary to meet contract and regulatory requirements. Contractors will submit a request to the department agency from which the uh, predominance of their classified work is derived, a request for access for its indirect cost personnel who have a need to know. This request should be sufficiently detailed to allow department agency personnel to evaluate the request and act, that is to negotiate, approve, disapprove. The department and agency will receive requests from contractors evaluate them using a whole government approach, meaning the processing background investigation requests, adjudicating investigations, and enrolling them into continuous vetting. And additionally, department agency will establish a policy for department and agency's implementation of this memorandum and regularly validate contractors' continued need for access to classified information with the intent of keeping the minimum necessary personnel um, within access. And then the other topic um, passed on was um, covered insider threat information sharing policy. So we recognize industry personnel represent a large portion of the total covered population. Many industry personnel work on site at government locations and often the U.S. government can know more about a contractor employee from both insider threat and personnel vetting perspectives. We recognize that government and industry share an imperative to protect personnel, facilities, and information, which is best realized when we work together to mitigate risk. In response to direction from Congress, ODNI is working to issue policy requiring department and agencies to share covered insider threat information to contractor companies where the information is adjudicatively relevant vetted and verified and relevant to the ability of a contractor to execute their insider threat responsibilities and the contractor employee has provided consent to sharing. The policy when issued will allow department and agencies to begin sharing information to industry to inform contractor actions to protect against insider threat, examples of which include direct threats of violence, damage of an, of other destructive malicious activities, um, malicious activities which could compromise or damage information technology systems or other capabilities, and information indicating that an employee may be a target for counterintelligence or counter espionage exploitation. 
four challenges remain, obtaining contractor employee consent, directing how information can be used, defining what information can be shared, and an extensive interagency coordination process. Consent. Um, we envision a two-phase approach to this. So first, the department agency will require contractors to obtain consent from their employee, and then second, ODNI is working with OPM to include consent within the personnel vetting questionnaire um, in a future version. And then use department agency will first determine that information can and should be shared, that it meets the definition and there is a need. So after which, the department agency will verify employee consent, and if so, the department agency may provide the information to the company for insider threat risk mitigation purposes. Sharing. So the policy grants the department agency the authority to share the information under certain conditions, while also enabling the department agency to determine whether the information should be shared. Department agency must establish their policies and procedures to execute and document this process. Interagency coordination, the ODNI began the informal coordination process by engaging with industry partners and representative groups to frame the problem. We also engaged with the intelligence community security directors, Department of Defense, and OPM. We are now engaging with those organizations and groups plus OMB and DOJ. We expect additional informal coordination to occur through the Trusted Workforce Advisory Group before pushing an updated policy to the same groups for formal review later this summer. So while we have made significant progress, much work remains, particularly in the interagency, in the interagency coordination process, which will be extensive, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and we will endeavor to keep industry apprised of our progress on this. And that is all I have for updates. Are there any questions for me? I, I've got a couple, actually, if you don't mind. This is Greg Sather from Industry Um on, on the last item regarding the insider, covered insider threat um, event sharing or information sharing, uh, one, is there a, what's the kind of anticipated timeline on when you expect that to go through and be released? And then two, will those uh, sharing plans or information sharing plans that the respective agencies have to put together, will those be made available in some context to industry so we can better plan for how that agency would interact with us? And then I got a couple others, actually. Um, okay, so I might not know the answers to all these questions, um, but if I don't, I'll certainly take it back and, and try to get some answers. Um, so with regard to the first question, I unfortunately don't have the timeline. Like I mentioned, we're, we're hoping to um, move to the next level of coordination this summer. But again, we will do our best to keep everyone apprised of the progress. And then um, with regard to the plans, that is part of, I would presume, part of the coordination that's um, happening now as, as we talk through with, um, with, the different entity, with the different entities who um, form this policy. So I don't have any specific answers right now, but that's certainly something I will share um, with the individuals working on that. And what other questions do you okay. have? So on the, what my, my words, overhead clearance processing, um, you described the process where companies can identify the the largest or most impactful, whatever that terminology is going to be, um, agency proposal plan, et cetera. Has the government thought through some of those limiting factors if my company has the preponderance of my work with a three-letter agency and maybe an unacknowledged status, but the, there's a chunk of my business that works with DOD? How will, would that play? Is it going to be um, some type of information flow into from scattered into DIS because of that relationship? Or am I, is the company going to continue to be challenged to go through and do sponsorship and crossover, that type of thing? And again, I understand you may not have the answer, but just request the government to think through that while the bulk of a business may be focused in one area. We, we all 
cross over and bring capability to various aspects of the government. So it's a great step. Just please consider the full cycle. And then um, the last question I've got back way back into the personnel vetting questionnaire. You, you highlighted that it's going to be an online only or electronic only solution. Does that apply throughout all of government? As there are a couple agencies who will remain nameless that are rather hard copy oriented. So is that expected to be some type of specific solution or does the ODNI um, foresee some type of exemption to the online only capability of the PBQ because of that agency? Um, so at this time, the, the, the intent is that this is an, an electronic form only. Um, however, you know, there will be discussions and opportunities um, during um, development to, to figure out, do there need to be some other, other considerations? But I don't have a specific answer for that today. Okay. Food, food for, for next update, obviously, or if, if through any of our working groups, we can help flush that out. I'm, I know we are willing, ready, and able. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Lisa. Do any of the other NISPAC members have any questions? Yeah, Heather's Dave Tender. Um, I got a question. Uh, Ma'am, qu quick question. I'm going to go off what Greg said. I chair the, the NISPAC and Test Threat Working Group. Um, and the uh, question would be, is, as, as you go forward, we'd love to be helping be part of that with you um, as you start coming up with information sharing. And, and I have a question that may already been said or not said. Um, I'm assuming that you're working with all the other all the other government entities in reference to information sharing as to what what we can and can't do, with, and the other agencies are working along with you on this, or is this a complete ODNI effort? It's an ODNI led effort, but it will be a, a policy, but it is being coordinated um, at this time, as I mentioned, informally across multiple entities, and of course we'll go back through a. Um, through formal coordination of the one which being a TWAG, which has um, certainly pretty much every agency is invited to have a member attend. Um, however, they may not all attend, but certainly that information would go out for sharing and coordination through that group. Okay, I appreciate it. Like I said, uh, this pack we're willing to help. We'd love to, we'd love to help partner anywhere we can with this. Thank you. Okay, and I'll also pass along the part about um, about the information sharing, um, wanted to be a part of that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dave. Any other NISPAC members have questions for Lisa? Seeing this, how are we looking on questions? We don't have anyone in queue, but there are a couple of questions in chat. Is there a timeline of when the PBQs will be implemented? That is from Amanda Egan. I don't have that answer set off the top of my head. I apologize, but there's certainly something um, that I can try to see if we have in our uh, implementation strategy for Trusted Workforce 2.0 more forthcoming or to share back through Heather. And one final question in chat from Greg Pannoni. Will employee consent be required? If not, will this impact their security clearance? I'm sorry, what did that one in relation to? Is, is um, Lisa, that's all we have, Craig. If you are able to come in on the phone, um, it would be greatly appreciated. If not, we'll move on and we can get that sorted out. Um, okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, while we give him up. Oh, um, so it looks like uh, Greg said in the context of sharing insider threat information. Will employee consent be required? If not, will this impact their security clearance? So that was the part where we were talking about the update to the PVQ, where some um, additional information would be um, addressed that particular matter in there. Thank you, Lisa. All right, are there any other questions for Lisa in ODNI? Not at this time. Great, 
Thank you. Thank next. you very much. Thank you, Lisa. All right, next we will hear from Don, with, who is the Chief of the Central Intelligence Agency Security Policy Staff. Don, you're up. Good morning, everyone. Um, we've been asked to, to address or explain this one issue with regard to polygraph reciprocity process. Uh, for our polygraph reciprocity, CIA follows the requirements, directives, and guidelines set by od and uh, such as SEEDS 2 and 7, uh, ICD 709, and the related IC policy guidance documents. CIA has a polygraph um, reciprocity with those federal organizations that participate in the DCSA, National Security, sorry, National Center for Credibility Assessment, uh, NCCA, Quality Assurance Program. The NCCA Quality Assurance Program certifies that an organization's polygraph uh, program meets federal polygraph policies, guidelines, and standards. CIA will accept uh, equivalent uh, scope polygraphs which have been adjudicated and reported in scattered castles. However, if a polygraph is not equivalent in scope to CIA's requirement, uh, additional polygraph testing will be required. For example, if a counterintelligence scope polygraph is conducted by another agency, but CIA requires also requires uh, full scope polygraph coverage, then CIA would conduct additional polygraph testing to, to meet the full scope polygraph requirement. Uh, a full scope polygraph consists of a counterintelligence scope polygraph and a limited scope, um, what used to be referred to as a lifestyle polygraph. Uh, also, if an, if an individual is out of access for two plus years or the polygraph is extremely dated, then CIA will likely require a new polygraph. Over the past year, CIA has achieved significant progress against um, polygraph backlog and timelines. The agency is actually averaging approximately 60 days to complete uh, polygraph processing for industrial contractors. Our industry partners can help to continue this progress uh, by ensuring that their personnel are available for polygraph processing immediately upon being sponsored by their company. Also, it's important to note that any contractors sponsored from within the WMA area uh, that are currently uh, are that they're currently eligible to to be a standby candidate, uh, meaning that the person could be available to report for an appointment within 24 hours of being contacted, and then that would be uh, that would expedite their polygraph processing. That's in case uh, there's some last-minute uh, drops where they can push somebody into that slot. And that is everything. If anybody has any questions, let me know. All right, thank you, Don. It sounds like there are no questions for NISPAC, from NISPAC members. Candace, are there any questions from the, hey, in the queue? Hey, Heather, I do have a question. Oh, I apologize. Go ahead, Ike. This is Ike. Um, is that 60 days for the poly? Is that is that accurate? That's that's what we're averaging uh, in in recent it, over the last year or so. We've we've been uh, really cutting down on the timeline. Okay. All right. And that Thank goes you. that goes along with our, you know, the the efforts to get things through 180 days and that whole effort that we've been making over the last two years or so. And this is just part of that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any other NISPAC members or questions? All right, Candace, how about in the queue? We do have one question in chat uh, from Greg Pannoni. Could you be more specific about the time frame for extremely dated? Uh, here. I don't have that information in front of me, but I can I can check on it to see what what is meant by that. I, the, that information was passed on to me. All right, thank you, Don. I'll have that as um, an action item for you. I appreciate that. Any other questions for the CIA? All right, um, Mr. Tracy Kendall, the Personnel Security Policy Program Manager for the Department of Energy, will be providing their update. 
but please note there are updated slides and will be sent after the meeting concludes and will be updated on the website as well. However, the WebEx does have the updated slides. Tracy? Good morning and thank you, Heather. Um, and good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Department of Energy, I wanna thank Mr. Derek Jones and Ms. Tracy Durkin for their service as NISPAC industry members. I also want to congratulate Mr. Keith Menard on his retirement and for his many years of service to the nation. It's been a great pleasure working with you, Chief, over the last 18 years. And now I'm gonna present the information um, as requested from the NISPAC on our, uh, on DOE's polygraph reciprocity process. The Department of Energy utilizes counterintelligence scope polygraph examinations primarily to resolve foreign nexus issues developed during counterintelligence evaluation of cover persons who have been nominated for access to high-risk access programs, i.e. SCI, SAP, Sigma, et cetera, within the department. And for cover persons randomly selected for a random CI evaluation, which always includes a CI scope polygraph examination. The Department of Energy also administers polygraph examinations to DOE employees who are detailed to or who require access to other U.S. government agencies or special programs. The DOE does recognize and accept other U.S. government agency administered polygraph examinations that have been favorably completed within the previous five years. Uh, this concludes the DOE response for the polygraph reciprocity process topic uh any questions that was coming in not just in this public meeting man thank you tracy over to you heather thank you all right thank you tracy any questions for tracy kindle and doe candace any questions in the queue not at this time all right thank you Next up is Mr. Matthew Armstrong, Chief with the Office of Physical Security, and Mr. Blaine Bucci, Chief of uh, Industrial Security, both with Security and Counterintelligence with the National Security Agency. Gentlemen, could you please provide the requested NSA update? Thank you. Hi, how are you doing? This is Blaine Bucci. We uh, have been requested to update over the air transfer for CryptoKey. Uh, there have been a lot of ongoing issues for the last, I guess, two years with regards to this. In the summer of 2022, there was a message to industry that OTAT would no longer be accepted after December of 2022. Unfortunately, though, the intent was good. Implementation sort of uh, proved to be problematic, and the impact was not realized until a large contract population requiring the services could not uh, get their keys updated. Needless to say, the process had to continue until a full solution was implemented. The OTATs will continue in the near future. However, currently there is a pilot that's in the beta stages of testing, which it's shown to be successful. However, uh, NSA is not going to get uh, ahead of their skis this time, um, and they'll do a definitely a measured, clear message for the full solution for when the changes actually do occur. So as of today, there's not a full solution. An industry should continue to utilize the same OTA, uh, OTAT process as usual. Uh, the transfers will continue to be scrutinized as always. Uh, the office that's gonna be responsible for inquiries is the cryptologic, uh, cryptographic keys and code production organization. Uh, on the, on the, it would be, their website is iad.gov slash key support. That's the update that I have. All right, thank you. Are there any questions for NSA? All right, Candace, how about the public? Anything in the queue or chat? No question, thank you. All right, we will now hear about the much anticipated safe process update purchasing from Mr. Chris Pollock, the unit chief policy, that the unit chief of the policy standards and engineering branch with the general services administration and chairman of the interagency committee on security equipment. Chris. 
Thanks, Heather. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity to address the NISPAC today. Um, today I'm going to address one specific topic and that's the purchasing of GSA approved containers by contractors and subcontractors. Um, first I'm going to go through some of the regulations that affect the purchasing of the containers and then go through some of the actual details of creating a, a requisition and entering it to GSA to make the actual purchase. Um, next slide. So as you can see here, the official regulation, uh, 32 CFR, requires that whenever new storage containers are procured, they shall be in accordance with the standards and specifications established by GSA and be available through the federal supply system. Um, in 2014, GSA changed our procurement system for the security containers to address concerns raised by the intelligence community specifically to better control who could purchase the containers and to increase the funding to create a more robust testing program. In coordination with that effort, ISOO issued procurement clarification in the form of ISOO Notice 214. Brief excerpt is, is listed here on the slide. Um, as you can see, this require, requires that all containers be purchased through GSA Global Supply. Next slide, please. When that clarification was issued, we realized that many contractors would not be able to immediately comply. Um, an exemption process was established to allow contractors to contact GSA. GSA would review the request, determine if it represented a legitimate need for the containers, and approve the exemption and allow the requester to purchase directly from one of the approved manufacturers. The exemption process was established to be a temporary solution to fill the gap while contracting officers and contractors made the necessary arrangements to order through GSA Global Supply as required. As you can see here, the exemption process was discontinued in September of 2019. One other, and that allowed for five years for contractors and contracting officers to make the necessary arrangements to order through GSA. One other thing that we realized through the exemption process was that there were a number of third-party businesses involved in supplying GSA-approved containers. Sometimes that process involved a number of third-party uh, businesses being involved in the supply chain. Um, including those additional supply chain steps in the procurement process represented a potential risk to the accountability of the containers through the supply chain and also added additional unnecessary costs. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits of the change? The primary reason was to increase the security of the supply chain. The intelligence community asked that GSA include limited use requirements, which limit the purchase of the containers to government and government contractors who need the equipment. These changes were not made in a vacuum. There's an interagency committee established to provide input and direct the security equipment program of GSA. Um, we have representatives from many of the intelligence community members, including DOD, DNI, CIA, Department of State, and others. Um, the second reason for the change to, to require G, uh, containers to be purchased through GSA was to increase the funding for establishing of the standards as well as testing and approval and quality assurance. Um, this program is industrially funded. All money to run the program comes from the sales of the containers. So there's no appropriated line budgets, and it was necessary to make sure that the containers were purchased through GSA so that the critical funding could be provided. Uh, next slide. So that's it for uh, background and, and regulations. Now we'll step into some of the actual procurement steps required to purchase GSA-approved containers. Um, next slide, please. As you can see here, there's a GSA order that authorizes the storage of classified informa information. Um, the administrator has determined that fixed price contractors and low tier contractors who are required to maintain custody of security classified records can purchase GSA approved containers from GSA. Typically, this is done through a contract and typically the mechanism is a DD-254 or equivalent form that requires contractors to have safeguarding uh, requirements. Next slide, please. So the second step in the procurement process is to obtain an activity address code, otherwise known as an AAC or DODAC. 
and sometimes a GSA accounting code. AACs are um, established, assigned by the contracting officer. Many times this is done when the contract is initially let. Sometimes it requires going back into the contract later on down the road and assigning an AAC to a contractor. Um, subcontractors can receive their own AACs. That uh, process has to be worked up through the prime contractor and again to the contracting officer who can assign the activity address codes. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. Okay, so uh, one question we hear a lot is about how do bills get paid? Um, typically, uh, contractors use the VCSS or Vendor Customer Self Service Portal to actually view the bills, and then you can register in Pay.gov to pay the bills. Pay.gov allows uh, many different forms of payment, including bank accounts, uh, corporate credit cards, debit cards, PayPal, Amazon, pretty much any form of payment that you can envision is allowed by pay.gov. Slide, please. So ordering, the third step in ordering security equipment. Um, typically, contractors order using offline process, fed strip or mill strip. Um, this entails filling out the applicable form for uh, mill strip, that's a, a CD form 1348. For a fed strip, that's standard form 344. Uh, fill out those forms and then email them to GSA. GSA will then enter the requisition um, and issue the purchase order to the appropriate manufacturer. If you're in the sort of the unique case of being a contractor who has a .gov or a .mil email address, you can use TSA Advantage or GSA Global Supply Online for ordering. Again, most of the orders come through the offline ordering system. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an example of the 1348 form. Um, as you can see, it's it's a bit of a dinosaur. It's based on the old 80-column IBM format from the, the 1960s. The good news is that many people have made it through submitting this form in the intervening 60 years and been able to order um, supplies from GSA. Um, I'll go through. Uh, the ordering process and the details of this form in, in a little more detail uh, later in the presentation. Next slide. GSA does track the um, contractor ordering of our GSA approved containers, and we found that around 25% or $10 million worth of the total sales of containers over the past years, year, past year were to government contractors. We've had orders uh, successfully processed by many different industry partners, including Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, L3 Harris, and, and many others. Next slide, please. So here's the, uh, some additional uh, links to additional resources, including step-by-step -step contractor purchasing guide, frequently asked questions, GSA security containers catalog, new for 2014, that lists all the available containers uh, for storage of classified information. Uh, next slide, please. And that's the end of the official presentation, but I do have a couple more slides that I added at the end that actually go into some of the details of the forms themselves. So um, next slide, please. Okay, so again, hopefully you can see this better than it's showing up on my screen, but this is a screen, basically it's a cheat sheet for the um, Standard Form 344 that uh, that shows some of the standard blocks that, that can be filled in, some of the standard fields, and the information that can be included in them. Um, next slide. And this is a list, column by column, of the actual information that should be placed into each of the fields. Um, again, this is kind of a cheat sheet. There is um, instructional manuals, 20 pages worth of of words and information on how to fill in these forms. Um, this just provides a quick cheat sheet to uh, to assist people in, in getting the forms filled out correctly. Uh, next slide. And again, this is sort of the same thing for the 1348 for the mill strip form with some of the fields filled in. And one more slide, please. 
and again, the, the field by field information that can be uh, used to, to assist in filling in the forms. So that's it for my presentation. Um, I'm going to throw it back to Heather now, and uh, thank you for your attention. Great. So it looks like we lost about um, the last couple of minutes when you started back to your slides. Would you mind going in again? I'm sorry, Heather, you were you were breaking up? Uh, I'm sorry, you were breaking up, Chris. Uh, repeat that. Heather, I think your audio is is breaking up a bit. All right. Um, so if if there are questions for Chris, um, you can email him directly at C H R I S T O P H E R dot P O L L O C K at G S A dot gov. And Candace, can you put that in the chat? And we'll go ahead and move on since there seems to be some audio issues. But thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. We will now take a five minute. Hey, Heather. Oh, yes. I, I, I do have one question. This is Greg Sadler again. Sorry, I'm chatting so, today. Um, so, I don't so believe Greg, it's, it's direct to Chris. So, um, Greg, since we're for Matt. some audio issues with Chris, um, if we can just hold on your question and I'll reach out to him after. Does that work? Sure, I'll put it in chat as well. Okay, thank you. We will now take a five minute break. Please be ready to resume promptly at 12.05. Thank you. All right, thank you. Hope everyone now was able to take a quick break. We are now moving into the portion of the meeting where we get reports from the NISPAC working group. However, we will not be discussing all the working groups at this time. We have provided slides with highlights of them. If there are questions about a specific working group, please email nisppac at nara.gov and we will get back to you. You have already heard from, from, C from some CSAs and CSOs on the high level points of what was discussed during the clearance working group on March 6, 2024. We will also hear from DCSA for their security clearance and information systems metrics, along with metrics from DOE. We are now going to hear from Mr. Dave Scott, Deputy Assistant Director for NIST Cybersecurity for DCSA's information systems update. Dave? Yes, good morning. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, David Scott with DCSA, a NIST authorization official. Um, so uh, I've got a couple of slides here and um, I'll speak to those. So the first slide, um, NIST Cybersecurity Office. Uh, one thing I wanted to pull out on the, the title of this slide is that we have changed our name. Uh, it used to be, you may be familiar with the previous NIST packs, it was the NIST Authorization Office. Um, we changed our name recently to the NIST Cybersecurity Office in order to better uh, uh, capture exactly what our cybersecurity uh, uh, mission is across the National Security Program. Um, such as not only RMF and authorization decisions, but also CORAs or Cyber Operational Readiness Assessments, formerly known as uh, CCRI. And I'll get into more on that in a little bit. So, um, next slide. Uh, NIST EMAS updates. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on here. Um, as we've, I've dove into a lot of the specifics with these slides with the NISA Working Group, which is great partnership and collaboration with Mr. Sadler and the, the industrial security team. Um, and, and, but the NIST EMAS updates that I want to call out here, we had a major revision on March 2nd, uh, a, a re re revision 5.11 of our NIST EMAS instance, which is an isolated instance that industry utilizes for our uh, managing our assessment and authorization packages, uh, security packages for industry. Um, the the, uh, the highlights that I want to put out is the, is the auto-generated uh, authorization letters that were uh, are now able to be uh, established as, it's been working for uh, quite some time now. It saves a lot of uh, ISSP time and also provides a lot of quality and consistency um, in, in describing exactly what the systems are authorized for. So we're, we're very excited about that. And then one of the other things that I'll go into more specifically on the next page, but is uh, enhanced metric and reporting capability uh, with this change. Uh, never before have we been able to 
provide industry timelines uh, for our assessment and authorization packages. One of the big things that we wanted to um, uh, uh, really strive for over the last couple of years is transparency in partnership with the NISA Working Group. We made a, a huge stride two years ago in uh, what was our package workflow. Industry could see exactly where their, their packages are at any given time once they submit to DCSA. Um, but now we're able to capture automatic met uh, metrics from EMAS, um, not only just DCSA time, which is all we were able to do his uh, historically ever, now we're able to capture industry time, and I'll get into more of that in a minute. The other thing that um, what we did kind of behind the scenes with this EMAS update is prepare for um, uh, NIST 853 Rep 5. Um, we're not transitioning yet. We're going to be very closely working with the NISA working group um, when we do that, which will probably uh, work more towards that towards the end of this FY and, and next FY as far as um, what that the transition plan would look like. Um, however, we've got to do some prep preparatory things first. And so we behind the scenes in, in working with this so we, uh, and part of this update, we did do some um, uh, application uh, items to in order to accommodate Rev 5 uh, kind of behind the scenes. Um, so next slide, high level national metrics. Um, still uh, hovering right around 55, 5,600 systems in our portfolio. Um, that's been a steady state going back the last couple of years. Um, so, so no big changes there and still around 3,600 users. Um, over the top right uh, is system authorization uh, statuses within the National Security Program. Not going to go too many details here. These are our, um, just our, our decisions. So authorizations, uh, not yet authorized. That is a, uh, a queue of what is in our portfolio. And um, conditional authorizations, which is uh, a, similar to the old IETO, um, but basically you, you're, the industry is able to process classified, but with some specific conditions and more of a shorter timeline. One thing that I want to point out here is you'll see 70% um, is, is ATOs within our portfolio. That is extremely high. And that's a good news story because that means that um, the risk is acceptable uh, of our assessment and industry is able to achieve a full three-year authorization. So uh, that is a good news story. Uh, bottom left-hand corner, and this is what I was talking about with the metrics from uh, the 511 release within the EMAS. Um, we're now able to provide a, uh, a timeline of industry and DCSA time to make a decision. So from the start of industry submission to the actual authorization time frame, and to break that down to kind of uh, what we have is the roles is the ISSM from industry. We have a triage process that's included in this metric, which is the SCA, our contractors. Um, and then we have the ISSP plan review and onsite. We have a team lead, which is the supervisory role of the ISSP for a QA and then the regional authorization decision. Right now, nationally, this is coming straight from EMAS, that, that average, that national time uh, for median day is 78. Um, and then uh, extensions, which is a tool in the, uh, the, the tool in the regional authorization uh, kind of toolbox is uh, to provide extensions on, um, for a variety of reasons, uh, in that, uh, or is about 15 days. So uh, 78 days, that includes DCSA time and industry time. And uh, we know from previous uh, NISPAC and NISA working group briefings that it's, we've covered right around 50 DCSA days. So uh, pretty good uh, time frame. That means the back and forth between industry has been pretty quick uh, from my perspective. Um, over on the right-hand side, it's just more of a trend going back from uh, the last year of um, authorizations processed and extended. So you can just, uh, <clears throat> so this is more of just an understanding of the trends of the authorizations that would process month over month throughout the last the year. Um, for me, what I look at is you can kind of see the kind of the dip down right in the December and the holiday time frame, and then right when uh, we get back to work from usually the break, the holiday break, you'll see a big spike. Um, so that's, that's just some of the trends that we see over the past uh, year. Um, next slide, please. Uh, DAFM 3.0 update. Um, and again, the name change is to be determined. Uh, we have not settled on a name. Uh, it most likely will uh, drop the M uh, from, from, the, from the, the, the DAPM, but uh, more to follow on that later. Um, where we are in the status is, of the DAPM revision and updates um, are that we have uh, partnered with the NISA Working Group for an informal review. Um, we've got those comments back in, I think, the February timeframe, and we just yesterday did a high-level outbrief to the NISA Working Group uh, talking about uh, our, our where we were with the comments and moving forward. Um, really appreciate the, the partnership with the NISA Working Group and the feedback. Uh, we had a lot of uh, administrative items that we've addressed, such as references, um, acronyms, 
Um, also providing clarity, making sure that uh, there was a better understanding of what we were trying to, to capture in this supplemental guidance. So very much appreciated that. And then also want to note that the DAPM um, does also include the NIST Connection Process Guide that was also previously coordinated with the NISA Working Group. Um, so overall, we're very excited about the document. We're looking towards forward towards the next step, which will be more of the formal coordination process. So we will work um, that in the in the coming months to start formally coordinating that for public release. I don't have any timelines on that, um, so we will uh, we will I'll try to I'll keep uh, the, the group informed as to what I know. But um, that is the next steps. Um, we we appreciate the NISA working group coordination. Now we're going to start the formal coordination process. Um, next slide, uh, we talked about cloud uh, a little bit in the beginning of this NISPAC meeting. Um, happy to report that uh, in partnership and, and namely uh, Mr. Keith Miner from DCSA uh, should take a lot of the credit here uh, leading this effort um, on the ISL cloud and getting this turned around so quickly. It was, it was a great accomplishment. It provides uh, clarity into um, uh, uh, commercial cloud services offerings uh, for, for a national security program. Um, and really just talking about the DFARS requirements. So uh, from a high level, uh, there's three options that we are providing as for clarity for industry. Um, when there is a, a classified cloud computing uh, uh, as an option to perform on a contract. Uh, one is the 254, uh, Block C, uh, to receive, store, and generate classified information materials checked uh, and details on the use of IL-6 classified cloud pursuant to, to contract uh, specific performance requirements and are provided in line 13. Also, um, number two there is information not provided on the 254, the contractor can verify to DCSA that the DFAR uh, 7010 uh, cloud computing services is um, included in the contract. Um, um, or step three, if the contractor initially indicated in the solicitation that it did not anticipate using uh, classified cloud services in the contract, um, but decides later decides otherwise, then um, proof of con from the core uh, of approval may be accepted in a variety of forms to include as, as a simple email um, uh, and that that would work as well. So this has been pretty much well uh, communicated uh, through the pilot and then also uh, with uh, various um, clear contractors that are interested in the cloud. But uh, this ISL provides uh, more national level guidance and really appreciate all the efforts of Mr. Miner and, and other and USDINS and others uh, with, with uh, getting this out. Uh, we've received positive feedback to date on this ISL. Uh, next slide. The job aid for cloud, classified cloud. Again, industry, there is an, isol uh, an, an isolated secret region that was uh, part of the pilot that we worked uh, over the past uh, years. Um, we've documented our, uh, our, our lessons learned um, and uh, in partnership with DISA, DOD CIO, we've developed a uh, job aid that's, uh, you can be found, that can be found in EMAS um, that has been very useful um, in uh, that pathway to the cloud. Uh, that industry and government stakeholders are uh, interested in and can take a look at. Um, so uh, there, there's a, still a lot of things to work through with the cloud, a lot of questions that within the cloud as far as capabilities, what I can, based on what I have been working with with a lot of the, the clear contractors and government stakeholders, um, the best advice that I could say is uh, step one of RMF or step zero uh, is to prepare. Uh, making sure that uh, any um, stakeholder interested in classified cloud capabilities, please review the uh, provisional authorization and all the services being offered. We are um, very much in, in, in solid partnership with DISA, um, with all um, cloud uh, services being offered in not only the isolated secret region, but all things cloud. So we continue to partner and look forward to um, future engagements uh, with, with cloud capabilities. Um, and then lastly, um, CORA, uh, Cyber Operational Readiness Assessment, uh, that's I'm on my last page of my slides, um, formerly called Command Cyber Readiness Inspection or CCRI. Uh, the name change happened um, uh, formally on March 1st. Uh, CCRI 3.0 was a pilot and it officially became CORA 3.0 on March 1st. Uh, bottom line is uh, the inspection program went from a uh, compliance-based to a risk-based methodology. Um, and focusing on key indicators of risk, so uh, what those risk indicators are to the DOTEN. And uh, so the, the, the checks, the test is still the same, um, and we still give the, we follow all of JFHQ protocols, and um, the, the, uh, the test is still the same, it's just certain key indicators of risk are elevated or weighted more heavily, which does impact the score. So um, 
We have been advising uh, cleared industry when, uh, when there is a scheduled CCRI um, and the cyber leads reach out 90 to 120 days out, please engage um, and collaborate uh, early and often uh, because when we see that early and often engagement, we do see success with these, uh, with these chorus. When we uh, have found that the engagement is uh, right up to the inspection, um, they, we do find that they're problematic and, and not successful outcomes. So um, uh, I highly recommend reaching out, engaging early and often, and ask, ask questions because we do provide um, in accordance with JFHQ, uh, the, the, uh, what, what, the, what the actual inspection uh, is going to be and what we're looking at um, that with our um, initial email uh, to the facility. Um, we're continuing to um, expand uh, our, our core team. Um, in years past, uh, we've always uh, utilized ISSPs and IS reps from the field. Um, Dual Hatted is certified as uh, CCRI, previous term CCRI reviewers. Um, we are now moving towards a dedicated team and relieving the ISSPs and ISRs from that, that, um, that mission set. We're in a transition year. Um, this year, we're, we're uh, scheduled to conduct 30 uh, CORAs. We're going with the uh, hiring of our CORA personnel and dedicated teams. We're going to be plussing up to around 45 next year, next FY, and then increasing all the way until we conduct a CORA every other year. Um, on any uh, cleared contractor with a, a DOD uh, approval uh, uh, to connect to the CIPRANET. Um, and uh, I think that's the total of my remarks. Uh, pending any questions, that is all for me. All right, thank you. Are there any questions for uh, Dave Scott in the NISA working group. All right, thank you, Dave. Are there any questions for Dave in DCSA in the NISA working group? There were a couple of questions in chat. Okay. Okay. Um. um if you can go ahead and ask them, I would greatly appreciate it. I'm having some phone issues right now. Right now. Absolutely. One moment. Uh, Al Concord is asking if they can briefly address classified solutions for commercial. Many CDCs, including Georgia Tech, do provide research testing on similar devices in support of DOD and IC, yet we know those devices are not authorized in CDC facilities. What, if anything, can be done to authorize similar devices in facilities with restrictions in place that will allow for that unclassified research, testing, and demonstrations? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I can't comment on unclassified uh, uh, processing. Is, is our um, my, my mission set is, is is focused on collateral classified in the National Security Program, but I can tell you that um, we do partner with NSA, um, and uh, there is we we will accept as far as encryption NSA Type One or equivalent, and uh, we do have some capability packages that are coordinated with the NSA Commercial Solutions for Classified Office. And we have approved that uh, within a NISP. There are no further questions. All right, thank you. Any NISP staff members have any other questions? Okay, we are now going to hear from Mr. Michael Ray. Deputy Assistant Director of Operations of Bet for Betting Risk Operations with DCSA for their, for their betting statistics. Mike? All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, yeah, so I'll just go ahead and get started here. Um, so, first thing, uh, first things first, uh, name change from, uh, from VRO, and I'll talk about that here in just a second. So, uh, DCSA Consolidated Adjudication Services, formerly known as DOD CAF. Um, and Betting Risk Operations, VRO, merged on March 22nd, 2024. 
um, to form a new cohesive organization, edu uh, adjudication and vetting services, AVS. Uh, the merger will strategically align personnel and resources to support Trusted Workforce 2.0 uh, functions and enable effective protections from threats uh, to the U.S. Um, AVS will carefully manage the transition to ensure services continues um, without interruption during this transformational period. Um, now, looking, taking a look at the slide, the end-to-end -end timeliness um, that's on the bottom part of the slide. Um, T5 initials, FY24, Q, uh, Q2, end-to-end. -end. So we are 18 days for initiation, 179 days for investigation, and 46 days for adjudication with a total of 243 days total end-to-end. -end. There is an asterisk um, with the adjudication. Um, so uh, during the quarter, a this technical issue was identified that impacted um, a total of about 1,600 uh, top secret eligibility determinations um, that resulted in that temporary spike in timeliness that you see is reported as 46 days. Um, the technical issue is resolved um, and AVS will continue to work with DISC uh, to monitor and address any technical issues. You can also see the footnote there that the remainder 4,500 cases um, were adjudicated at 20 days. For the T3 initials, FY24 Q2 end to end, we are at 17 days for initiation, 81 days for investigation, and 22 days for adjudication for a total of 120 days total end to end. Um, there's also an asterisk there for T3s under, under the investigation. Um, there's a delay in FBI name checks that impacted the investigation timeliness for about 1,100 secret investigations. That increased that timeliness to overall 81 days. The remainder of the 9,900 secret investigations were completed in 78 days. 90% of all initial investigations had an interim determination made on average within seven, seven to 10 days. You can see at the top right of the, uh, of the slide there, the total investigation inventory for T5 is at 20,000, T3 is at 17,100. The adjudication inventory for T5s is at 546, T3s is at 1300. For reciprocity, AVS continues to deliver reciprocity decisions at an average of one calendar day. Um, for industry conditional, so in, in February 2024, AVS started to implement the issuance of con conditional eligibility determinations for the NIST population. Um, the conditional support mission readiness by removing a case from due process and using CV to monitor compliance and support risk mitigation. AVS posted a news update on the DCSA website with a fact sheet on conditional eligibility determinations. That fact sheet was sh uh, shared internally with industrial security and externally with the components. Uh, moving along, SF312s, so also on February 22nd, 2024, ABS posted a job aid for the NIST population on the use of digital signatures on the SF312. The use of digital signatures on the SF312 is optional. ABS will continue to accept manual or wet signatures on the SF312. If a digital signature is used, please ensure that the ECA PKI is from a DOD sponsored approved list. If the subject digitally signs the SF312, the witness box does not require a signature. I'm going to transition over to discussing the adverse information. This has come up during the, uh, the clearance working group. Um, so when AVS receives adverse information, uh, risk management methodology is used um, to determine the actions needed to resolve. So if the adver adverse information is of low risk, then it is closed out in the system of record um, within one to two business days. We also receive adverse information that may require additional information, whether that be from the FSO, um, such as clarifying information or an updated SF-86. Once that information is, is received, ABS may request investigative work uh, to be completed, such as an RSI, and that timeline varies for the completion of the RSI based on the amount of field work needed. The adjudication timeline may vary as well, depending on if the case goes through due process. Um, there are instances when we receive adverse information and it warrants routine use of the Privacy Act uh, to provide that information to the FSO um, due to that risk level of the information. When that action is necessary, the case is prioritized and there's coordination between internal DCSA staff and the FSO to ensure that you and your company are aware to uh, take appropriate uh, precautions from a physical security and insider threat perspective. 
Um, as far as it relates to CV alert management, post-CV enrollment alerts are generated based on uh, established thresholds which align with the federal investigative standards and adjudicative guidelines. CV is impactful as we average about a 6% alert rate. Criminal and financial are the most common valid actionable alerts. For FY24 thus far, ABS has received 35,000 industry alerts of which 7,900 or 23% were not previously known from 6,300 unique industry subjects. Just note that this information should have been self-reported as our goal moving forward is to have individuals self-report information as it occurs. And that is my update pending any questions uh, from the group. Thank you, Mike. Are there any questions from this past moment? Ms. Evans, do we have any raised hands? No raised hands. But... Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. We do have a couple of questions in chat from Deborah Belsinger. Is there a reason for the gradual increase in end-to-end -end timelines? Are there more cases being submitted, lack of personnel to process, or is this a quality issue? Yeah, so this is Mike. So, um, so yes, in uh, the FY23 uh, Q2, we did start to receive a, a surge of investigations coming in, um, which uh, helped to attribute to the, uh, to the inventory rise there. Um, and then also to um, take a look at it from uh, the investigative perspective, Right, so we're looking at increasing investigative capacity, right, increasing the, the use of overtime, right, to, to address that. Um, as far as the adjudication timeline, as I had indicated, right, we had a technical issue within the system. Um, we did, <clears throat> excuse me, we identified that um, and we'll be continuing to, to watch uh, this closely and work with the DIS team to ensure that doesn't happen again in the future. So we did see an increase in submission of investigation requests. Um, and then also just looking at uh, using some investigative investigation resources um, as well to address that. Thank you, Mike. Are there any other questions? I think there was also a follow up to that. Um, is there any indication that the investigation times are decreasing? Um, yeah, so from what I can, you know, what we have on the slide there, um, you can see what the, what the timelines are. You can do see that, that, uh, slight increase from the past couple of quarters there. Um, I, I think we'll continue to monitor that, um, and we'll have more updates as we go along through the FY, um, and especially up at the next meeting. We have no further questions. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Tracy Kindle is a person with the Personnel Security Policy Program. He is the manager of it with the Department of Energy. We'll be providing their metrics. I do want to note that I misspoke earlier. The um, slides that were sent previously and on our website are accurate. Tracy? Uh, hi, hello. Hello, everyone. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so um, for this particular metric, DOE continues to meet the ERPA goals uh, on average over the last four quarters, uh, recognizing this is through quarter one uh, with an average initiation time of 11 days and 15 days for education respectively. Uh, next slide, please. Again here, DOE continues to exceed the average for the initial top secret initiation and adjudication goals um, for the year. Slide four. Uh, no difference here. Uh, so we're, we're doing pretty good overall, of course, and we're meeting our ERPA goals. There's really no um, update as far as any changes with the initial secret population. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the T5Rs, um, our, over the last four quarters, our initiation time has been 10 days 
And uh, the one pickup we had here with the adjudication, we went up to 21 days for adjudication through uh, the first quarter of, uh, well, first quarter of FY24. Uh, Excuse me, second quarter of FY24. Um, that should be the last slide there. Next slide. See if there's another slide. Okay, last slide. Um, overall, again, we continue to meet the ERPA goals for the T3s. Uh, the initiation days are at 11, and our adjudication days are at 15. Um, as always, if our industry partners have any questions, concerns, uh, from a DOE industrial security perspective, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we're ready to assist as necessary. Are there any questions? Our DOE, I see something in the chat, Heather. Are DOE clear personnel? No, please, please go ahead, continue. Heather, I think I saw it. Something in the chat from Greg, Greg Pannoni. Yes. I didn't get a chance. Yes, sure. To call. Go, go ahead and go ahead and read it since you've got it. Yeah, let me try to open the chat here. Okay. Oh, I, can go I can, I can, yeah. Um, go ahead, Candice. Um, may ask, are DOE cleared personnel enrolled in CV? If so, what are the T5R and T3R periodic reinvestigations attributed to? And they said they should say contractor personnel. Yeah, so all the all of DOE contract clear contractor personnel are enrolled. Um, as far as it being attributable attributable to the T3 and T5, um, as individuals are enrolled in continuous vetting, um, once we start enrolling individuals in continuous vetting, that allows us to uh, forego the reinvestigation. But we are still submitting. Reinvestigations on some individuals where required if they are if they don't have clean cases when they go into when we're attempting to put them into the continuous vetting capability. Thank we you. We have Tracy. no further questions. All right, thank you. Do any other NICPAC members have any questions for us? All right. Are there any questions about any of the working groups or what you have heard from the working group updates? All right, sounds like there is not. So next we will hear from Mr. Perry Russell Hunter, the Director of the Defense Office of Hearings and Appeals, also known as DOHA. Perry, over to you. Thank you, Heather. Um, am I unmuted? Yes, you are, sir. Hearing you loud and clear. All right, thank you. So first of all, I want to I want to thank Heather for facilitating this uh, this meeting, uh, and and I I'm I'm speaking to you from the uh, the Impact 24 conference uh, because I was also speaking here today, and and I was I just want to say it was great to see you earlier in the week. It's really important for the Information Security Oversight Office to be represented in settings like this, and you will be amused to know that one of the speakers today did inform the audience how to correctly pronounce CUI and that it is not CUI. So uh, with, with that said, um, thank you for your great facilitation here today. I also want to congratulate Keith Menard on his retirement and thank him for his service. Uh, uh, from Doha's perspective, um, the uh, uh, everything is is running normally. We have a um, current uh, workload of uh, legal reviews of statements of reasons, which of course is the initial stage in the industrial security clearance uh, uh, due process um, of about 300 cases, and uh, those are all uh, within the our 30-day turnaround time. Uh, one of the things that we started doing with the pandemic was uh, being able to do those uh, electronically when uh, both uh, what was then called the uh, uh, the CAF or CAS and is now called ABS uh, was remote and so were we. Uh, the other thing we got out of the, uh, the pandemic was uh, we began to really uh, use teams uh, in earnest to uh, convene the due process hearings. And that meant that pre-pandemic, we were probably doing 
about less than 25% of our hearings through remote video teleconference. Uh, by the end of this year, I think we will probably have reached or passed the 75% mark for use of remote video for hearings. Um, this is obviously a great time saver um, in terms of um, saved travel time, um, also in, in downtime for the AJ's writing the decisions, as well as travel costs. So overall, uh, a, a very good trend. However, we are still holding some hearings in person. There are some hearings such as uh, the mental health cases under the uh, mental health guideline and the uh, more complex cases, including uh, security violation cases or handling protected information cases where, uh, or cases where there are a lot of uh, uh, witnesses where a judge has to assess credibility um, it's obviously uh, more optimal to assess credibility in an in-person hearing, and so those are uh, continuing to be held, um, and it is in the discretion of the administrative judge as to when to do that. Uh, I also wanted to uh, comment on a couple of things that, that Mike Ray said and, and really uh, foot stomp the value of the conditional clearances. Um, this represents an innovation by uh, DCSAs, uh, what used to be CAST, now AVS. Uh, for cases where it is the most efficient thing to do uh, to, to grant a conditional clearance rather than trying to put someone through due process. And we at Doha uh, applaud this and we fully support it. And in fact, there are some number of cases where we get a draft statement of reasons where we will actually recommend that. And it's been a very positive collaborative process with uh, the uh, ABS team. So I just wanted to say that that's a um, an innovation that's helping to put more people to work who should be put to work um, instead of having them wait for due process. Um, the uh, also wanted to just briefly comment on the uh, CV 6% alert rate. Um, as many of you probably know from having heard me uh, talk in this group before, uh, the denial or revocation rate overall is, is less than 2%, it's about 1.5%, and that's been, been true forever historically. And CE and CV doesn't change that. It just means that we find the needles in the haystack faster. So that, um, it also made the haystack bigger. So that 6% alert rate means that a lot of the cases uh, where an alert comes in are going to be adjudicated favorably. Um, the fact that these are mostly financial and criminal is a reflection on uh, the uh, data sources available, uh, but it's also a reflection on the fact that with um, credit reports, it, it's quite frequent that we will see something that looks like a potentially disqualifying issue, and then we find that it's mitigated when we get the rest of the story. So uh, these alerts are obviously uh, going to be tempered by uh, investigation, adjudication, and what we find in, in due process. And so that that rest of the story turns out to be very important. Uh, for those of you in industry who uh, have people who, who might have received a statement of reasons or even an interrogatory, those, those list of questions where either the CAS or Doha, or, sorry, AVS or Doha is trying to grant eligibility by just getting the rest of the story, um, please do uh, run at us with mitigation. It is very important that mitigation be introduced at the earliest possible stage in the process, and that is all the more true uh, with the, uh, the value of CV and CE uh, catching issues sooner. Uh, we also want to get the mitigation sooner. Um, and so that's, that's all I have, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Hafiz. Thank you, Perry. Are there any questions from any next group members? Ms. Evans, is anyone in the queue for questions? Not at this time. Okay, we are now at the point of the meeting where we ask for NISPAC members to present any new business they may have. Anyone? Okay. As a reminder, all NISPAC meeting announcements are posted in the Federal Register approximately 30 days before the meeting, along with being posted to the IC blog. Mr. Chairman, I turn it over to you to close out the meeting. Thank you, Heather. Uh, our next, next 
NISPAC meeting is scheduled for November 13th, 2024. With that, the meeting is adjourned.